Yeah, thanks for the update. And um, before the introduction, and I knew what the introduction was, I was going to ask this question. Does anybody know what ORConf actually means? Did, did anybody not know what it meant before you started? Uh, I mean, today, okay, yes. So everyone did know what it means, but it w I thought maybe people thought it was like AND gates and OR gates, and this is the ORConf. But no, it's the Open Risk Conference. And as you can see, there are not many um, actually open risk presentations right now. Um, but to keep the tradition going, this is my open risk update about what's going on. And so what is open risk? Um, it's another CPU architecture, just like RISC-V, ARM, Intel. And it was one of the first open source um, processors. So completely open, anybody can implement it. And it's 32-bit architecture. And it was expanded to 64-bit in the spec, but it was never actually implemented. So I would say it's strictly 32-bit right now. Um, there is a 64-bit FPU implementation that actually works. It can do 64-bit double floating point math on the Marocino implementation. So Marocino, more 1KX. And the OR, OK. The OR 1200 are the, the main implementations. And there are not many others. Like in RISC-V, when that was introduced, everyone wrote an implementation of the CPU. I think there were a few other open RISC implementations, but not many that are easily available right now. And I am the main maintainer of open RISC. And so does anybody know what this is? Anyway, not know what this is? It's a pinball machine, yeah. So that, that is what open risk has been like for me. So, you know, the ball um, in a pinball machine, it just bounces around and you, you keep playing and it's really fun. And for me, I've been maintaining Linux, the compiler, the simulators, the runtime, which is like newlib and glibc. And, and then I also dive into the hardware whenever there are issues. And um, so I want to tell you, you know, what's, what's been updated here in the last four years. Um, so to start off with, we have the, the formal verification. Um, so with risk, open risk, um, one thing I wanted to do was provide more continuous integration. So we used to have a, a verilator linting, which doesn't do much other than just say your, your open risk core has pretty good quality verilog. But I added um, the ability to run the, the, test, the test suite. So this runs a bunch of C and assembly tests to verify the FPU, the timer, uh, the MMU, and things like that. And so this runs um, on a daily basis now. Um, it basically checks that all these tests work, but then it also tests with different configurations. So what happens if you disable the dcache? What if you disable the MMU. What if you disable the iCache and, and different things? So if you turn on the FPU and you disable the FPU, do, do all these tests still work? And that's a pretty good way to test a few things. But the other thing we added in 2020 as part of a Google Summer of Code was uh, formal verification. And so that's the test that's running at the, the bottom there. And last year, in 2022, that was still working. But um, this week, when I was preparing the, the, the slides, I tried to rerun it and get some logs, but it, it fails. So um, something I'm going to have to be working on pretty soon, and, and maybe something we can hack on um, after, after the conference is the formal verification. I can show you what we did and um, where it's failing. It was a bit finicky to get it working, um, but it's, it's a good project. So that's something I want to work on. Uh, the other thing that I worked on was the glibc port. So why use glibc on open risk? Um, the main thing is actually testing. So if you can run the glibc, I mean, to get glibc ported, you have to you know, copy an existing port from a, an architecture like RISC-V, and you make it work on open risk. But then you have to test it. So glibc has thousands and thousands of tests, and that verifies things across your whole tool chain, chain like um, GCC, Assembler, the Linker, and, and all kinds of stuff. And that, that really helped um, 
suss out a lot of bugs. And this is just showing the board that I used to test it. So this is the Litex RT board running more 1KX. Um, for glibc, you test it over SSH. So you, there's a network connection, and you run your tests on a main workstation where you cross-compile. And when you run the test, it sends the binary over SSH. Well, actually, you mount a disk over NFS, and then you send the command over SSH, and it runs the test, and then it makes sure it works, and it updates over NFS the result of your test. Um, but it, it was also running an SD card. And why is there an SD card? One, to load the OS. But the other thing is, this board only has 128 megabytes of RAM. And one of the glibc tests um, does a memory test, which uses about a gig of memory. So it had to swap. So this test took a long time to run. It's all on a Litex uh, SOC. Now, so this, um, once the test was finally uh, working, this took a long time. We got all the tests working. I think there was one failure, which was actually an upstream bug that I fixed. Um, but if you look at the runtime, it was two days and 20 hours to run this test. Um, but glibc went upstream, and everything was, was great. So that, that was something that we did in the last four years. Um, take a picture. OK. So next. Um, so once that was done, I actually, does anybody know what this icon is on the left? WireGuard, that's right. It's a very popular VPN solution for Linux, and I think Windows has it as well, but it's a Android, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's one of the most popular VPN solutions ever, I guess, right now. And um, actually, Jason, the main developer on WireGuard, contacted me saying, oh, I'm running the WireGuard test suite on OpenRISC, and it doesn't work. So um, that led me to look into what he was doing. He was actually running on QMU, and so we detected a bug on QMU, but I got to the idea of is maybe I can... I, so I detected the bug, I fi fixed it, but then I found, oh, a QMU as a test platform is pretty good. So I expanded it. So we added um, multiple core support to QMU. We added a PCI support, which... That's added PCI support in the Linux kernel, so OpenRISC supports PCI. We also built this board that um, vert, supports VertIO, which are devices that you can just plug in now. So when you start up QMU, you can add a hard disk, and you can add network cards and all kinds of stuff. So you can, you can make OpenRISC on uh, QMU very easily extensible. And um, so the other thing that's good about that is the glibc test runtimes. Like every time glibc makes a release, you have to retest and report your results of your architecture. And so we got, went from 22 days to about six hours. So that's really helped making things work fast. But also, this is, is great for other tests that we need to do going forward, other things we need to port, anything. So QMU has provided a really good platform. Um, other things that are new is the, the mailing list. So there's no talk of LibreCores this year, but LibreCores was um, a, a home, a new home for open, open source cores, like, op what was it, open cores? Was that open cores before, now we had LibreCores, but that server died, and so the open risk mailing list was one of the main things that was still there. We've moved it all to uh, a Linux kernel mailing list, so even though the name says Linux open risk, you can send anything there, whether it's you know, hardware-related or software-related. We use that for everything. Um, the other thing is there's a cycle accu accurate simulator for OpenRISC. And um, I've provided, I, there was some, somebody contacted me recently saying that there were some issues getting this working. And so there are users in the world. And um, he had problems with it. So I fixed up the problems, but he also wanted a container image for it because he was trying to use some old, there were some virtual machine containers that we provided on the old open cores. And so I said, well, is Docker images OK? So there are Docker images. If you go to the OR1K sim project, you can get Docker images that have the simulator and the um, tool chains, which are from Embecosm, actually. Embecosm provides us um, nightly builds for the 
open, so open risk tool chain, which I use for a lot of stuff now, which is great. Um, the other thing is specification updates. So we're continuing to evolve the spec a little bit at a time. Um, in update 1.4, we added support for F FPU. So traditionally, the uh, FPU state um, special purpose register was only readable and writable in supervisor mode, which is not actually good for writing an FPU. Uh, user space floating point software, because usually the user space will just update the the rounding mode or turn on exceptions, and you know the, the kernel will take care of turning that off if it switches to another process and stuff like that. But OpenRisk said it has to be supervisor mode, which we just said, okay, make it user space. So, so what's coming up now is um, upstreaming the um, floating point unit um, support for, for glibc. So that, that's been um, actually cross-cutting multiple parts of the system. So we wrote the floating point um, support for glibc, but that also has to, we had to add the support in the OS for handling exceptions and then reporting those back to user space. And then also in the CPU, like I said, we had to make it so that the floating point um, state register is re readable and writable. So this is a diagram just showing what's the difference between a, a floating point application on the right and a non-floating point application on the left. Um, this is working now, but I'm working on upstreaming it and writing some documentation. But this is what's upcoming for open risk. What else is um, improved formal verification? As you saw, it was broken. The other thing I want to do is the open risk formal. So risk five formal has something where you run through all these ex instructions and it checks that they all work correctly. It'd be nice to have that for open risk. And then, yeah, just want to continue with more improvements. Build the user base. Uh, build the developer groups. So that's about it. Um, I just want to say, me, I have kids. Uh, I started off working. Does anyone know this, in my, uh, this icon on the right? No, this is Enlightenment. It's a window manager for, uh, for Linux, one of the old ones in the Red Hat six days. Um, I started off working on that in university, and then I work in Japan. I actually live in London and work in Japan. This is my office in Japan, this SNBC Nikko, and this is the Tokyo station. The office is right across the street. Has anyone been to Tokyo recently since they opened up? No. There are a lot of, oh yeah, there have been a lot of um, tourists coming in to Tokyo when I was there in the summer. And that's, that's oh, I like rock climbing a lot, so that's me. Okay, yeah, that's it. Any okay. questions? Nice work. Thanks. It's genuinely a Herculean effort, I think. Not only what you've done since we last spoke in Bordeaux, but yeah. uh, even before that, I think, sort of taking over the Linux port, taking over the toolchain ports, taking over the library ports. And if anything that breaks, Stafford knows how to fix it. He'll, he'll fix it for you. So. And a quick question, are there many users? Like, do many people pop up and, you um, know, commercial or otherwise? I've, uh, probably three years ago, somebody popped up from some analog d devices type of company, I, I can't remember. But I don't think they use it anymore. They stopped talking to us. Um, they probably moved to Risk Five. But what? What? <laughs> or ARM. But no. I, I do get people, it seems academics, trying to, who are using it still. Yeah, next question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm interested in, so what type of formal verification do you use? You use bounded model checking, or what were the methods that you utilized? Uh, formal? I was using, I, I don't know, YOSIS, and it has the, the K oh. induction and the BMC, basically. And you use both of it? Yeah, I use both of them. Oh, so okay. I'm using uh, Symbiosis, which is yeah. like a Python wrapper around it. And so I just run that, and it runs both of them at the same time, and I can specify how many um, steps of K-induction it does. And Matt 
Ben, right in the front row, taught me all of that through his YouTube videos. Yeah, thank you. Talk to me if you want to demo. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right, probably one last question, because I think we're a little bit over time. Oh, a little bit only, two minutes. So, just one question, short. So, um, now in Litex, in the build root configuration of Litex, right? Yeah. I would find the open risk def config. It will boot with glibc user land, right? Um, username would not be there. You user land glibc yes. user land. Yes. I think it wouldn't build. I mean, I, I haven't. I never build the software from Litex. I build my own build root, which I have. It's which is all upstream. Okay. If you build your own build root, you can build the glibc user land. Um, but yeah, Litex. The main core would do that if you have the SD card and yeah. kind of okay. set up. And uh, you support the PCIe also, so this light PCIe or some digital IP. If I also try to make it talk to the, I think it would work. Disk. I've I've only done it through QMU using PCIe and PCI. Um, yeah, I, I haven't used any real hardware yet. That would be. I, if I had a board that had PCIe, I would play with that. So Litex can do that. It has a light PCIe. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, yes, but that. I don't think I'm, I'm not sure if the Linux support is upstream for that. Maybe it's not okay. needed. Okay. I think you're considering open risk because of the excellent support, right? Yeah. <laughs> Extended support, yes. Yeah. Long-term support on open risk. <laughs> hey, thank you. Cool. Stafford, putting the OR in OR conf. Thank you, yeah. mate. Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs>